pressure grows on Corbyn in the anti-Semitism row. The Labour leaders being criticised for not acting quickly enough by a Jewish peer saved from the Nazis as a child. It's a disaster because many of us believe anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, racism are all equally abhorrent. Also tonight, a British oil rig worker is among 13 feared dead in a helicopter crash in Norway. Stopping the slaughter with Kenya set to burn a record haul of ivory, Joanna Lumley says we must get tough with China. Unless we hold places like China to ransom and just say you can't, we're not going to deal with you until you stop using ivory. I don't see what the hope is. And backing the Blues all the way as Leicester's manager eyes their place in footballing history. This is the ITV Evening News with Mark Austin and Ranveer Singh. Good evening. Labour tried to draw a line under the anti-Semitism row today, but they haven't been helped by one of their own peers. Lord Dubbs, who is Jewish and who was saved from the Nazis as a child, told ITV News it was a disaster for the party and Jeremy Corbyn had not acted quickly enough. Tonight, Labour said it was speeding up plans to tighten the rules against those who make racist comments. But Mr Corbyn was saying nothing today and neither was Ken Livingston, who was suspended following extraordinary scenes yesterday. Our political Correspondent Libby Vina has this. One MP forced to apologise for remarks seen as offensively anti-Semitic. The former mayor of London suspended for saying Hitler was a Zionist. It's not been the Labour leader's best week. Some in the party saying he should have acted much more quickly. This jaw-dropping confrontation with MP John Mann yesterday didn't seem to provoke any remorse on Ken Livingstone's part. You're, yes, you're a lying racist. Really? Why don't you go a, a Nazi apologist. A Nazi apologist. A Nazi apologist. A Nazi it was several hours before Jeremy Corbyn intervened. Labour peer Lord Dubbs, who fled the Nazis as a child in 1939, was appalled. So I think it's a disaster because many of us believe anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, racism are all equally abhorrent. And the thought that the Labour Party, which I've spent all my life in, is not as, is not as strong an anti-Semitism as it ought to be, damages it. Brought to London on a kinder transport from Prague, Lord Dubbs is currently pushing for Britain to take more child refugees. Does it trouble you what's gone on in the Labour Party this week, given your yeah. own story? Yeah, of course it does. It troubles me enormously, because if I'd thought the Labour Party was racist or anti-Semitic or homophobic, I wouldn't be in it. Uh, so I, 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 but I trust the Labour Party on the whole is not, and what we need is firm leadership to slap it all down. I think the leadership has been a bit slow in responding. If they'd, if they'd spoken out clearly and strongly at the beginning, some weeks ago, they could have nipped this in the bud. The Labour leader yesterday dismissed talk of the party being in crisis, but he's under growing pressure to change the rules, so racist comments prompt immediate disciplinary action. We clearly need to uh, be absolutely clear with party members, with the public and with the society uh, at large that there is a zero tolerance of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party and that's why we have uh, a number of investigations ongoing and that is why we will be bringing forward uh, new proposals to clarify the policies, procedures and the rules in relation to this so that swift action can be taken. Tonight there's still no sign of an apology from this man. You're wasting your day, I'm not doing any interviews. Although many Labour MPs fear his remarks yesterday could jeopardise council seats in next week's elections. So Libby, I suppose the question is, will these new proposals be enough to satisfy the party? Well, we heard from a senior member of the Shadow Cabinet there suggesting that these changes will happen, but we haven't heard from the Labour leader himself. He was maintaining what you might say is a diplomatic 
silence today, but the problem is I think it was his inertia yesterday, the fact he took so long to come out and suspend Ken Livingstone that is most troubling. I think people feel that when Ken Livingstone had suggested that Adolf Hitler was in favour of the creation of the State of Israel, the fact that didn't raise um, alarm bells, didn't set alarm bells ringing in the Labour leader's head, they think that is pretty extraordinary. And I think there are some in the party who are wanting much clearer leadership from him on this issue to stamp out uh, this suggestion that the Labour Party is no longer a party of tolerance and compassion. It's a party that tolerates anti-Semitism. All right, Libby, thank you very much indeed. In the past few minutes, the Civil Aviation Authority has suspended all flights of Super Puma helicopters in the UK. It follows the crash today of one of the aircraft which was returning from an oil rig in Norway. Thirteen people, including one British man, are thought to have died. As Juliet Bremner reports, the same type of aircraft has been involved in a number of accidents off Scotland. The burning wreckage gave an early indication that there were unlikely to be any survivors. The Super Puma helicopter came down on the edge of a small island close to the Norwegian town of Bergen. Eyewitnesses reported seeing the rotor blades crashing to the ground before the aircraft burst into flames. I heard a terrible bang, this woman explains. I told my husband to go outside and check what had happened. I turned round and saw a huge cloud of smoke. Rescuers searched both land and sea for any sign of life, but after several hours concluded that all 13 on board had perished. The Foreign Office has confirmed that one of those killed was a British citizen. The helicopter was a Super Puma, similar to the one seen here. They are the workhorses of the offshore oil industry, ferrying thousands of people on and off rigs. But there have been questions about their safety record, when this aircraft became the third in 18 months to be involved in accidents in the North Sea. Since then, the gearboxes have been replaced, but tonight the Civil Aviation Authority announced that it was suspending all UK flights of the same Super Puma model involved in today's accident. Juliet Bremner, ITV News. A former South Yorkshire police officer has angered families of Hillsborough victims today by blaming Liverpool fans for the disaster. Former Chief Inspector David Sumner, who was on duty that day, told ITV News fans' actions contributed to the tragedy. Sally Lockwood is outside South Yorkshire Police Headquarters for us this evening. And extraordinarily, Sally, these comments come just days after those historic Hillsborough inquests in which the fans were not to blame, it was ruled. Yes, exactly, Ranveer. After hearing two years' worth of evidence, the jury this week found the exact opposite, that fans were not at fault. So it's little surprise that this has incensed Hillsborough families who fought long and hard for 27 years to clear the names of their loved ones. A message praising the work of Hillsborough officers was removed from the website of the National Association of Retired Police Officers. But now, today, Dave Sumner, who was on duty on the day of the tragedy, has gone on to give his personal views, saying the behaviour of some fans was partly to blame. There was a minority, and there are a large number in that minority, who seem to be able to think they can go when they like and do what they like. Uh, now, And that of, led to this disaster? It, it certainly contributed to this disaster. There's no doubt about it in my mind, and to the mind of many other people as well, who were not called as witnesses. So have the families had anything to say? Well, of course, this has yet again angered families who just days ago were celebrating some sense of justice for their loved ones. A solicitor representing some of the relatives has said it's indicative of the problems within South Yorkshire Police that they seem to find it impossible to face up to their failings. This, of course, has been nothing short of a very bad week for the South Yorkshire Force, whose chief constable was suspended following the verdicts this week and his replacement lasted just 24 hours. For many, this is a force in crisis. Sally Lockwood, thank you. The partner of the former EastEnders actress Cyan Blake has admitted killing her and her two children. The bodies of Miss Blake and her son Zachary and Amon were found at the family home in Kent in January. Arthur Simpson Kent travelled to Ghana but was extradited to face charges. He's yet to enter a plea.
and a teenager fascinated by serial killers has been detained for 27 years for the murder of two strangers in Essex. James Fairweather was 15 when he murdered James Atfield and Nahid Almina in Colchester in 2014. The head of a scandal-hit NHS trust is refusing to resign despite another damning report into its leadership. The Care Quality Commission found Southern Health is still putting patients at risk. It follows the death of Connor Sparrowhawk in 2013. Martha Fairley reports. It began with the death of a vulnerable young man, but exposed faults not only in the NHS unit where he was staying, but across the whole trust covering five counties in the south of England. Now inspectors have found the same trust is continuing to put patients at risk. 18-year-old Connor Sparrowhawk had epilepsy, autism and learning difficulties. He drowned in a bath at Slade House in Oxford after he was left unsupervised. But it emerged he was not an isolated case and his family have battled to find out why he and hundreds of other vulnerable patients died. From the moment Connor died, we've just had to sort of fight every inch of the way and, and it's, it's totally unacceptable actually because it was such, he should never have died. His death was completely preventable and we've been forced into this space where we're sitting here three years on nearly, still trying to get some sort of accountability. I find that astonishing from the NHS. It's just wrong. Today's report by the Care Quality Commission found Southern Health had no robust arrangements to investigate incidents including deaths, resulting in missed opportunities to prevent similar cases. There were also no effective measures to identify, record or respond to concerns about patient safety and inspectors have serious concerns about the safety of patients with mental health problems and learning disabilities. Certainly. The, the leadership of the Trust had not got a proper grip on all of the services. Whether that was due to its size and its, its, um, the wide distribution of the services, we're not sure. What we do know um, is, is that the Trust needs to be better led than it is at the moment. Southern Health's chairman and one of its governors have resigned, but its chief executive, Katrina Percy, remains in post. She says the Trust's introduced new procedures and made some progress. But until it can show it's actively working to protect its most vulnerable patients like Connor from the risk of harm, it will remain under close scrutiny. Martha Fairley, ITV News, Oxford. Still to come on the ITV Evening News, Joanna Lumley on her fight to force China to ban illegal ivory sales. And the man who's making Leicester City's dreams come true on the song that's firing up his players. Those stories and more right after the break. Welcome back. The actress and wildlife campaigner Joanna Lumley says it's time to get tough with China over the huge illegal market in ivory. In an interview with ITV Evening News, she says the West shouldn't trade with Beijing until it fulfills its promise to ban all ivory sales. Tomorrow, Kenya will publicly burn more than 100 tonnes of seized ivory to highlight the scale of Africa's poaching crisis. Around 230,000 elephants were poached between 2009 and 2015, and around 70% of that ivory ends up illegally in China. I've been speaking to Joanna Lumley for the latest in our series, Stopping the Slaughter. <laughs> Under guard, they have gathered the tusks from across Kenya and they are building the pyres for the biggest ivory bonfire in history. Right here, a hall worth tens of millions of pounds on the black market. Joanna Lumley believes destroying it is the right thing to do. I believe in burning it to show, to show the world that ivory has got no place in the world, you burn it. But you know, Mark, the truth of it is, is that no matter what we do, you have to go to the source, you have to go to the users, you have to go to the people who are buying it, who are commissioning um, the slaughter of elephants. To points to China. Points to China. What can we do about a, a country like China that says it will ban ivory sales but, but hasn't and there's no sign of it? Unless the Western world holds up its fists to China and says, you're going to have to fight us to get this stuff, and this is the deal, we want to trade with you, but you've got to sign this agreement. You've got to sign it and you've got to stand up to it. So what you're saying is that trade with China should be linked to a proper 
crack down on the ivory sales. Unless we hold places like China to ransom and just say you can't, we're not going to deal with you until you stop using ivory. I don't see what the hope is. Prince William was telling us um, a few weeks ago that we have five to ten years to save the rhino. Um, how bleak is it, do you think? It's dreadful. What's happened to us as people? What's happened to us as, sure, the guardians of the earth? It, means, it just means that we're the, the toughest people here. We're the most, we, we kill more than anything else in the world. We are the slaughterers. We are the killers. We are the killers. It's absolutely horrifying, isn't it? Controversially, Prince William told me that regulated trophy hunting was acceptable under certain circumstances. Joanna Lumley disagrees. I don't care for the idea of shooting anything for sport. I don't like it. I like clay pigeon shooting. And if you are going to go out and try to take down a cheetah, go with your bare hands and see how you get on. Don't take a, a gun. Guns are cowards. Guns make cowards us of all. We, we just sit there with our gun and point it and think we're clever. The animal hasn't got a gun, it can't shoot back. Do you think that the battle is being lost when it comes to protecting these great species? No, we mustn't say that. Well done for Kenya for burning this colossal mound of confiscated ivory. But let's use that huge fire to set fire to our determination to address this properly. Not to stand by and go, what's somebody else doing about it? Make it your problem, my problem, and the people watching this. Make it our problem to solve. And let's do it. Joanna Lumley there, and there's more from our series Stop the Slaughter, including uh, my exclusive interview with Prince William on our website, itv.com slash news. Now, UKIP is being tipped to gain around seven seats in next week's Welsh Assembly elections. Not bad, then, for a party that last time didn't win a single one. The party's rise is partly due to June's EU referendum, but also due to dissatisfaction among traditional Labour and Conservative voters. Our correspondent, Rupert Evelyn, reports from South East Wales. The political wind may be about to change in Wales. The most striking difference within these valleys is expected to be the arrival of UKIP. Cashing in, it's claimed on those left behind by the economy and a sense that traditional parties are not delivering. Why are UKIP making inroads in Wales, do you think? And put a donkey out there with a Labour sticker on it and it's just guaranteed a seat. And I think UKIP have uh, really put Nigel Farage have really have done, done damage in this country. I wouldn't vote for Labour. But they probably get in, I can't see anybody beating them, but they will lose a lot of us. UKIP's opponents argue their candidate here in South Wales East is an opportunist, ousted from Westminster with little attachment to this patch. What are your Welsh credentials? You don't really have any, do you, particularly? Well, um, I was uh, brought up uh, in Somerset. My, my parents live uh, just outside Bristol. So in South East Wales, it would be nice for me being uh, back closer to them. But I do believe that there is just a huge opportunity for UKIP to improve public services in Wales. Conservatives may slip into third place in the Assembly and fear the impact of UKIP. They have got some degree of support, obviously. Um, I think it's a, a shame that that is the case, particularly Conservatives that are thinking about voting for UKIP, because essentially a vote for UKIP is, is going to get the Labour Party back in government. Arguably a hangover from their Westminster defeats will hit the Lib Dems here, and Labour, who rule, may find their Welsh reign is over. Obviously, we'd like people to vote uh, uh, Lib Dem all the time, but I think in this particular election, you know, there's, there's a lot at stake. And we have to, you know, we have to appeal to, to like-minded people sometimes. I firmly believe Labour will have the majority of seats in the Assembly, and that's why I'm out on the doorstep. You'll need to find somebody to get into bed with. I'm, I mean, you know, this is something that's for discussions after the elections on May the 5th. Um, our priority at the moment is getting out there, making sure our voters get out to vote. Welsh nationalists Plaid Cymru are upbeat, but anything less than more seats would be seen as a disaster. People, especially at a Welsh national election, are looking for local candidates with local connections. The Welsh public will look at the candidates that are being fielded by all parties, and if they see that one is using it as a retirement home for failed Tory MPs, that that might backfire on that party. With a new party expected in the Assembly, the climate is changing. And maybe it's politics too. Rupert Evelyn, ITV News, Wales. And these are all the parties standing in the South East Wales region for the Welsh National Assembly elections. 
Now, excitement is building in Leicester ahead of a massive weekend for the city's football club. On Sunday, they could clinch the Premier League title for the first time in their history. Celebrity supporters, the rock band Kasabian, have already announced a celebration gig. But the club's manager, Claudio Ranieri, isn't jumping the gun as our sports correspondent, Ian Payne, reports. In 48 hours' time, Leicester could be champions. They may have their cake, but they can't eat it yet. Nerves are raw, but if there's one man keeping his head when all around are losing theirs, it's the manager. The people want to continue to dream and they start to enjoy. But you know me, I'm a pragmatic man and I need three points more and we want to do this. Ranieri may be the only man in town who's keeping calm, whilst the others, like celebrity fans from the Leicester band Kasabian, can hardly contain their excitement. They've announced they're going to play a concert at the football stadium to celebrate the title, or not. Around these parts, if things, um, if things go good, we have a party, right? But if things go bad, we have an even bigger party. <laughs> oh. So we'll be fine either way. And what's the manager's view of them? What is your favourite Kasabian song? Fire. It's the song the club uses to celebrate goals, and Ranieri's even used it in team talks, which has gone down rather well with Kasabian. Well, he said, he said it on a match of the day, didn't he? First game in the season. It's the best thing we ever heard, wasn't it, really? You know, yeah. I mean, I've met, we've met the guy, and he's a he's wonderful human being, isn't he? He is. He's, he's, he's incredible, yeah, yeah. All this incredible human being has to do now is win the title. Ian Payne, ITV News, in Leicester. <laughs> Lovely stuff. And finally tonight, the Queen and Prince Harry have shown their funny side in a spoof video released ahead of next month's Invictus Games. Harry is seen talking the Queen through a programme for the event before they receive a video message from the Obamas. It's quite close, isn't it? A message? Yeah, from Michelle. How very yeah. amazing. So you would like to watch it together? Yes. Let's have a look. Hey, Prince Harry, remember when you told us to bring it at the Invictus Games? Careful what you wish for. Boom. Oh, really? Please. Boom. <laughs> Love that. I would say that is 1-0 to the Queen. I would agree. She's just out called Obama. She certainly has. Julie Etchingham uh, will be here with all the news now. at 10. Julie Etchingham will be here at 10. Good evening. Ha, ha, ha.